Uh, the past um, February, beginning of last month, I had an opportunity to go take a trip to Israel. And um, what's it was incredible for me is because, you know, I had, uh, Israel was a place where um, much, most of what we find in scriptures, this is where it took place. And so for me, everything that I had read about for years and years, I was able to go and actually experience and actually see firsthand. And uh, it was really some life transforming moments. I, I'll never read scripture the same way uh, again. Um, and while I saw some incredible sights and some incredible scenes, there was a couple of times where I saw some things over there that sort of scratched my head a little bit. And um, uh, are you familiar with the term paradox? Paradox is, is a, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a contradictory statement. And so a, a paradox would be like jumbo shrimp, right? And so, you know, that's, it's a contra- it contradicts itself. And so there was a couple of signs that I saw over there that were, that were contradictory of themselves. One day we went out on the Sea of Galilee and uh, the Sea of Galilee was, was incredible. This is where Jesus performed this area where he performed most of his miracles, did most of his ministry. And we were able to be out on the Sea of Galilee, to look off into the hillside there, the sermon where Jesus preached on the Sermon on the Mount. And I'll just the road just a little bit where he uh, multiplied the fish and fed the 5,000. We went to a, the, the site where he preached the Sermon on the Mount. And there's a church there that had been erected, and it's a, you know, and it's a, you know, monument that, you know, for the memorializing the site there, and uh, it's the, it's called the Church of the Beatitudes, and outside of the Church of the Beatitudes, it's a beautiful section, it's a beautiful uh, uh, area, but I saw a sign that I thought was kind of a paradox, it was sort of strange. Take a look, I've got a picture of it here, see what you think, can you read that? I don't know if you can read that or not, it's kind of small, maybe some of you can it says, let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water flow from within him. And then this sign over here, water not for drink. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of a paradox, right? I mean, you know, don't drink this water. And that's, it's hard to tell there, but that's a little, you know, a little pool of, of water. Um, there's another one. Another time we went in Jerusalem and we went to... Um, the Church of Agony. I think I've got a picture of it here. And that's the Church of Agony. This sits on the site where this is the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus, uh, before he was arrested, the night he goes and he prays, and he's in such agony, he sweats drops of blood. And of course, this has been a church that's been erected again to memorialize this site. Um, but inside of that church, there's a sign. And I don't have a, a picture of it, but it says um, in, inside the church, It says, no explanations in the church. No explanations in the church. Now, that's, to me, kind of a paradox. It's sort of a contradictory statement. Now, what they meant was, tour guides don't come in here and get your group together and start explaining what happened here. You know, they they, they wanted us to stay calm, and, and it's a place where people come and pray. You know, that was the intention, but... But I started thinking about that. They said, no explanations in the church. And I thought, you know what? That's exactly really the opposite of the way church ought to be. The church ought to be a place where we do explain things. Or a church ought to be a place where we try to make Scripture as clear as we possibly can. And that's what I try to do every week. I know I fall short every single week, but that's what I want to do. I want to make this as clear as I possibly can because, because the words in this, these pages they, are, they have the power of, to, to bring life transformation. This gospel message that I'm going to share with you today and that I believe is so important and can absolutely change your life forever. And I want it to be clear. And I want you to understand it. And so I want to, I'm going to do my best to do that today. And I'm going to be reading a passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. In fact, there's some in front of the pews. It'll also be up on the screen. But I, I want us to talk about the gospel today. I want us to talk about the good news, this news that I believe that can absolutely change your life forever. And I'm going to try to make it as clear as I possibly can. 1 Corinthians 15. Look what it says. And Brian read from 1 Corinthians 15, the latter part. I'm going to read from the beginning part. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, 
I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. Okay, the, the, that term gospel, it literally means the good news, right? The gospel message, the good news. He says, I, I want to remind you of it, what I've preached and what you've taken your stand. By this gospel, by this good news, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I have preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. And he's about to tell us what the gospel is. Paul's about to share the good news with us right here. He says that Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. See, that's the gospel message. The good news that we preach every single week in here, we do our best to do that, is that, is that Christ died for your sins, that he was buried, and that he raised from the grave. That's the gospel message. That's the good news. That's what we proclaim today as we gather on Easter Sunday. Now, the death of Jesus really isn't disputed, right? I mean, there, there's not often, you know, there's not too many people that really argue the existence of Jesus. Historically, you're not going to find very many arguments from any serious people that would dispute that Jesus walked on this earth. Historically, we know, even outside the pages of our New Testament, we can know outside of this that there was a man named Jesus who was executed during the reign of Pontius Pilate. He was a Jewish prophet, and that many people, many Jews, believed him to be the Messiah. We would know that without the pages of Scripture. We know historically that Jesus walked on this earth. Now, and that, you know, that he died. That's not a dispute for most people, right? Uh, the dispute's not going to be over his burial. We know that Jesus was buried in a tomb, right? Remember, the, remember what happened? Jesus, after he was crucified, Joseph, the guy named uh, Joseph, he was from Arimathea, he kills the pilot. He says, can I take his body? They take his body down. He was already dead. They place him in a tomb. It was a tomb that had never been used before. Um, and so that's really not a dispute. The dispute, though, is the resurrection. I mean, this is really where the rubber meets the road, right? I mean, could, uh, how is this possible? How is the resurrection possible? And, of course, we know that that's still an issue for, for us today. It was an issue in the first century, and we're going to read that here in just a moment. But it's still an issue today. Some people say, well, he must have, uh, maybe the disciples hallucinated it all. Maybe they just sort of dreamed all this up. Or maybe they went to the wrong tomb. Maybe they took a wrong turn. They were supposed to go right and, and then straight and then right again. They went right and then straight and they took a left. Maybe they just went to the wrong tomb. Or maybe it was a false death. Maybe he wasn't really dead. I mean, you know, these Romans are experts, but hey, maybe they missed it on this one. Maybe he wasn't really dead, or perhaps they stole his body. And, and that's probably the most logical one, although why would anyone die for a lie? And so that's a question we have to ask ourselves. But the resurrection wasn't just an issue for us today, or isn't just an issue for us today. It was an issue in the first century as well. See, in the first century, of, of, there was Jews of different types of sects. You had Pharisees and Sadducees, Essenes. There was a variety of different ones. But the particular, there was a group, they were called the Sadducees. And they didn't believe in the resurrection. This was before Christ. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. Or they didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in afterlife at all. They, uh, they you know, that's why they were sad, you see, right? That's, you, you can remember it like that. Um, but listen to what Paul says. And Paul's the author here of 1 Corinthians, or Saul, same person. And he's trying to make this... Uh, them to understand that if there's no resurrection, that if there's no resurrection, then, then this whole Jesus movement really just doesn't have anything to stand on. Listen, listen to what he says. Drop down to verse 12. He says, If it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we've testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But 
He did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if, it, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now, Paul says, as he writes this, that if the resurrection didn't happen, if, if you Sadducees believe that there's no life after this death, he, and he lists several different things here. I just put a few up there on the board. He said, your faith is useless. Do you realize that without the resurrection, your faith is no good? We might as well pack it up and go home today. It, because everything, everything is based on the, on the resurrection of Jesus. See, if your faith is useless, see, you, you could say, well, no, I, Jesus, I think he was a good person. I've had people tell me this. He was a good person. I think he was a moral man. He was a good teacher. All of these things. And I'm going to follow that. Listen, he wasn't a moral man. If Jesus didn't raise from the grave, he wasn't a moral man. It makes him a liar. Your faith is useless, he's saying, if, 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 if the resurrection didn't occur. And not only that, you're still in your sins. Do you realize if the resurrection didn't happen. You are still in your sins. We're going to talk about next week the, the blood of Jesus and why it was necessary for him to die as we can, we'll continue a, a series that we are in, in Hebrews. But if you're, if, if, if without the resurrection, that death was powerless. You're still in your sins. As a result, you're still lost. You're lost. Now, nobody likes to hear that term. That's a very, you know, a very negative term for someone to say, to call me lost or to call you lost. That's not my term. Okay, that's what Scripture says. And so don't get mad at me. I'm not, you know, that's what the Bible says, that if you're outside of Christ, then you're lost. And not only that, but there, you're without hope. If there is no resurrection, there is no hope beyond the grave. How sad would that be? I, I went to two funerals Friday, thankfully both believers. But if there was no hope beyond the grave... If, the, if, that was, if this is it, I mean, how, de, how depressing would that be? Those families would have no hope of ever seeing a loved one again. We would have no hope of ever seeing someone who's passed away who was in Christ before us. And you and I, we would say, well, this is it. We might as well just live it up, get all the toys we can get, and then this is just, you know, it's over. There'd be no hope if the resurrection didn't happen. You realize all those different things. That's what Paul's trying to, to get us to understand here. But what if it did? <laughs> but what if a man named Jesus lived and he went to the cross and he died? And not only did he die a death for my sin and for your sins, but he was raised from the grave. Do you realize what that changes? That changes everything. And it changes everything for you and it changes everything for me. But how do we know it's true? How do we know it's true? How can we trust that the resurrection actually occurred? Well, let me give you two, two things that you, can, uh, that you can, and there's many things we could list. I mean, we just don't have time. But two things. Let me give you the first one. The first thing is eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. If the resurrection doesn't occur, you can see up on the Christianity crumbles. How do we know it's true? Eyewitness accounts. I, look, at verse, look at verse 5, and I know we're kind of going back and forth, but someone said they thought Paul kind of has ADD, and so I, I think he does too. So, so we're going to, or maybe I do, I'm not sure. We'll, but let's try to, you know, I'm going to go back and try to catch some of these things as we do it. But look what he says in verse 5. He's talking about how the gospel is being proclaimed, and he says, uh, on the third day, according to Scriptures, he was raised. And then he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most, listen, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. That's important. Then he appeared to James and then the other apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as the one abnormally born. When Paul says he was one abnormally born, he means that, that he was kind of a, a late addition to the apostles. He wasn't one of the original 12. He, he came along a little bit later on. But eyewitness accounts are so important when it comes to our faith. You realize this. See, today it would be like, it would be like me, for example. Let's say that I, wrote, I decided I was going to go to the paper and I was going to write, I was going to say every, all the events of 9-11, they were just fabricated. It was fabricated. It didn't happen. Now, what would occur? 
Someone easily could have stepped up and said, no, no, that, that's false. That's not true. I saw it. I witnessed it. I was there. I, I experienced it. Same thing is true of the resurrection. See, we have to understand that the pages of Scripture was being circulated still while these people were alive. That's why Paul says that, that many of whom are still living. This wasn't written some 200 years later. This is only years after the resurrection where people were still alive. And, and if this was fake, if what happened didn't occur, they could say, that's a lie. That never happened. They've made this whole thing up. But they didn't. There was eyewitnesses. And they could testify. And they could say, you know what? I saw him. I can testify to the fact. I didn't see him, but my sister, she knows someone. He saw the resurrected Christ. There were so many eyewitnesses. Over 500 Jesus appeared to over a period of 40 days. Not only that, but secondly, do you realize uh, the life change the, of those who, who experienced the resurrection personally? Think about this. Think about Peter. Remember Peter? Um, uh, remember what happened when Jesus, the night that Jesus was crucified, or the night that he was arrested, rather. Um, they're at the Garden of Gethsemane, and they had the Last Supper, and they in the room, and they've been praying, and, and uh, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and he prays, and he tells his disciples to watch and to pray, and, and then Jesus, the, the, the centurions come, and Jesus is arrested. What's Peter do? Peter's scared to death. He is absolutely terrified. Jesus has been arrested. They take him from the Garden of Gethsemane to the high priest, the Caiaphas' house, and then to Pilate. And this whole time they're traveling, Peter's kind of hanging back away. And there's people that along the road here, and they're saying, Hey, you were with him, weren't you? You were one of his disciples. What's Peter say? Not me. No, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. I wasn't with him. They go to another place, and, and, and another person comes up and says, Hey, I know you. You're with Jesus. And Peter says, Not me. Another person comes up to him and says, Hey, I recognize you. You're a Galilean. I can tell by your hick accent. You were with Jesus, right? And they say, and he, and he showers down curses. I wasn't with the man. He denies knowing him, even knowing him. Now, what can make a man like that who is scared to death to being identified with Jesus to only days after the crucifixion, standing up on the temple steps and proclaiming him as the Lord and Savior? Only the resurrection. Jesus, or Peter stands up. Thousands of people are in town. He stands up. Thousands of people are there. And he says, Jesus, whom you crucified, he points his finger at him and says, you killed him, is the Lord and Savior. Only the resurrection could change a man's life like that. Think about James. James was Jesus' half-brother. James thought Jesus was kind of out of his mind. I mean, he, he really was, he was a skeptic. He, he doubted that Jesus, you know, when Jesus started beginning his public ministry, James was like, ah, you know, I, let's, he's kind of out of his mind. You know, I don't know what he's talking about here. But do you know what, James? What happened to James? James becomes one of the, the churches of Jerusalem. He pins one of the books that we have in our New Testament under the name of James. And in James chapter 2, verse 1, he says, he, he proclaims Jesus as our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, what could make a man go from being skeptical and doubting to now calling Jesus his Lord and Savior? Just the resurrection. The resurrection. Think about Saul. Okay, Saul, Paul, that's the same person. Think about Saul. So if I say Saul one time and Paul the next time, don't be confused. Same guy. Think about Saul. Saul made it his mission to stop this Jesus movement. He made it his mission that he was not going to allow this Christian, you know, religion to get started. And so Saul set out and he persecuted the church. He had Christians arrested. He had Christians murdered. The very first martyr that, we've, that we read about in Scripture is a guy named Stephen. And while Stephen is, Stephen is being stoned, there's Saul standing right there and Scripture says, giving his approval. What can make a man go like that being a zealot, radicalized Jew 
to now making it his mission to make Jesus known among all people he comes in contact with. What is it? It's the resurrection. When, when I was in Israel, we went to a city of uh, uh, Caesarea Maritime. I ain't got a picture of it. It's an ancient city. That's just, that's just a picture of some of the ruins that they've, that they've uncovered. This is the city that Saul was taken to after he was arrested. After Saul's third missionary journey, he goes to Jerusalem. He's arrested. He's taken to this city where he's being held trial. Uh, Saul eventually gets tired of being there, and he appeals to Caesar. And so he's, gonna, he's waiting a trip to Rome. And so for two years, he's there in the city of Caesarea. When I was in, in Israel... The tour guide that we had that last day was an archaeologist. And he says, hey, I need to tell you all something. This is, this is sort of a best-kept secret, he said, around here. He said, we've uncovered, we've unearthed the area, this, uh, the cell where Saul was in prison while he was in Caesarea waiting to go to Rome. Now, they had uncovered it on the walls. They had written Saul, Saul, Saul. Now, he didn't graffiti it himself. Apparently, some Christians at some point came back, and this, this, this room uh, would have became a sort of a, a place of homage. But underneath where my friend is pointing would have been the room where Saul had been staying and in prison while he's awaiting his trial and run. What would make a man sit in prison for two years? And then go to Rome and be chained up and, 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 and not to count being stoned and being whipped and being shipwrecked and being left for hungry. What would make a man go like that from hating the church and persecuting the church to now making it his life mission to lift up Jesus? What was it? It's the resurrection. It's the resurrection. The resurrection changes everything. And it can change you too. Listen to what Paul says in verse 9. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, and I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He's saying, look, I don't even deserve this. I, I, I was a bad man. On other occasions, he says, I was the worst of worst. You think you're bad. Listen, you think, some of you think you've made some mistakes. You've got nothing on Saul. He was a murderer. He, there's so many things that he could point to in his life. You, listen, he says, I was the worst of the worst, but God chose him to be an apostle, to, to carry the good news to, the, to, to all the world, to be the greatest missionary the church has ever known. Some of you think, well, God can never use me. I've got, wor I've got a, a word for you this morning. He can use you, and he wants to use you, and he can change your life. The resurrection can change you. It changed him. Listen to what he says. He said, I, was, I don't deserve to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church of God. And then listen, I love this. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his grace to me, and his grace to me was not without effect. I love what Saul says. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's only the God's grace. It's only God's goodness. It's only because of this life-transforming moment and, uh, that, that God has done in my life. He showered with me his, by His grace. It's by God's grace I am what I am. And I could stand before you today and say the exact same thing. It's only by God's grace that I am what I am. Only by God's grace. Listen, the gospel is such good news. It has the power to transform your life. It has the power to change you in so many ways. But there's a couple of things that we need to understand from this text. First, as it applies. When it comes to this good news, when it comes to the gospel, you've got to receive it. You've got to receive it. Verse 1 says this. I'm going back and forth, I know, but verse 1 it says this. He says, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you've received in which you've taken your stand. Listen, this is good news this morning. I'm preaching good news to you this morning. I hope that you'll walk out knowing the good news, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But listen, this isn't just good news to be heard. This isn't just good news to be observed. This is good news to be received. And you receive it by making Jesus and trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You receive it by by believing. You receive it by placing your faith in Christ. 
by saying, God, I, I'm going to trust you no matter what. You believe it by repenting of your sins. Peter stood up and he said, you crucified the Savior. And they said, what do we need to do? He said, repent, change, turn your ways. And listen, this isn't just something that you can do and you can walk out of here today and say, okay, God, I'm going to repent of my sins. And I'm, going to, I'm going to walk away. I'm going to be different. Listen, God has to do it through you. God has to do this work, but you've got to be a willing vessel. You've got to allow him to do so. We repent of our sins, and then we're immersed in Christ. We're baptized. We're baptized. This is this incredible moment in which God, in which the gospel is preached. Do you realize, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, every time someone's baptized in here, do you realize that the gospel's preached? Do you realize that the good news is preached? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's preached every time somebody's baptized, Right? When, when, when we go up in this water, you're dead in your sins, you're lost, you have no hope. And then when you're, you're then buried in Christ, you're buried in the water, you're underneath, you can't breathe, you can't do anything. And then you're raised to the newness of life. The gospel's preached every time that someone's baptized. And so this life-changing good news, you've got to receive it. You've got to be willing to say, God, I... I I can't do anything to earn this. I don't deserve this, but I receive it. That's the way I've done. I, I certainly didn't deserve it, and I still don't deserve it today, but I have certainly received it, and I pray that you will as well. Secondly, what we see here in our text is that you retain it. Look what he says in verse 2. By this gospel, you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, Otherwise, you've believed in vain. Now, don't, don't read that passage and think, well, does that mean I'm going to lose my salvation? Does that mean if I sin, I mess up, then, then, then I'm lost? No, no, that, that's not what Paul's saying, okay? If you're walking with Jesus, there's nobody or nothing that can take your salvation from you. And this doesn't mean that if you, know, if you mess up, then all of a sudden, now I'm lost. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying here that you've got to endure, though. You've got to keep going. You've got to persevere. You've got to keep running the race. Paul says, look, I don't, want to be, I don't want to do this thing and be in vain. I don't want to get to the end and, and be like, what, what were you doing? I want to hold on to my faith. I'm going to keep, I'm going to re remain, I'm going to persevere. You've got to retain it. We've got to hold on to it. And we do that by every single day waking up and we, we, we rededicate our life to the Lord. Listen, when you came to Christ, oftentimes, and you know, maybe when you made a public decision, maybe when you were baptized, Sometimes get, people get confused and think, well, I, I make that decision, I'm done, right? I mean, that's all I needed to do, that's over, I checked that off the list, and I'm just going to walk on, you know, from this point on, and, and I'll check in with God ever so often. No, no, no. That's, that's not the end. That's the beginning. That's the beginning. That's the, that's the start of your walk. And every day, you hold on. You get knocked down, and you get up, and you brush your feet off, and you keep going and say, Lord, I blew it today. God, I'm messed up today, but Lord, I'm going to keep trusting you. I'm going to keep walking with you. I'm going to keep holding on to you. And you just keep persevering all the way to the very end. And we get to the end, and God says, well done, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. This is life-changing good news, and I want you to know about it. And I want you to understand it. I want you to receive it. And I want you to hold on to it for everything you've got, every bump in the road, every time you, something comes up in your life and you think, man, I don't know if I can go on. Or man, you get bad news and you keep thinking, the resurrection, it changed everything. It changed everything. I've got hope. It doesn't matter what I endure. Because of the resurrection, I can keep moving forward. I, I've shared with some of you um, uh, kind of a milestone moment in my life. One of those milestone, style, milestone moments in my life was a, a, a week of camp that I went to in high school. It was that week of camp in which I, I uh, rededicated my life to the Lord. It was a, that week of camp in which I decided to go into, into a Bible college and into, into some type of Christian ministry. And um, it, was, it was at that same week of camp that there was a girl there by the name of Jill. And uh, I don't know if Jill was part of a camp team that came with Cincinnati Christian uh, University at the time or Cincinnati Bible College at the time, or if she was just there with her father. Her father's name is Wally Rendell. Some of you, maybe you're familiar with that name. He's a longtime preacher like in Lexington area in the Christian church. But Jill made a big impact on me that week. She was such an encourager and, and uh, just, uh, was, was just, just bubbling with life. 
And not only did she make a big impact on me, she especially made a big impact on my friend Sean that some of you met last fall. It was Jill who really, uh, uh, Sean gives credit for to uh, actually going into the ministry and going into Bible college and, and in pursuing that career. Well, that following year after that summer of, of my uh, high school year of camp, um, Jill was traveling with um, the men's and women's basketball team at Cincinnati Christian uh, University. And they were, up in, uh, they were up in Michigan, and one of the vans that they were traveling with, it was snowing, and they hit a, a spot uh, of snow or ice, and uh, the, the van spun out of control. They had an accident. Uh, everyone on the van that was traveling uh, walked away with just, uh, just minor bruises and scrapes, except for Jill. Jill was, Jill was killed in that accident. And um, I, I, knew, I knew her uh, you know, fairly well, and so that was a, a difficult moment for me, but and so when I went to the funeral, I hadn't been to many funerals, and um, it was the first funeral that really I had ever been to in which there was uh, there was celebration. And I, I, I um, you know, of course, her family was devastated; they were just completely distraught. But at the same time, there was this hope. There was this hope that this wasn't the end. There was this hope that this, was, that this wasn't the finish, that they would, were actually going to get to see their precious daughter again. There was this hope in the resurrection. It was the resurrection of the dead. And, I, and of course, I, I, I knew uh, Jill's story, but I, I read it recently in a book where Wally had written a, uh, a, uh, a, a chapter. And I, I didn't know this part of her story. He said that she, when she was in middle school, she penned a poem. And I want to share that poem with you as we kind of wrap things up this morning. This is a poem that she wrote when she was in, uh, in, in junior high school. She wrote this. Easter is the time of year when people come from far and near and every part in all directions to celebrate Christ's resurrection. Resurrection is the name of the deed that gained the fame. When Christ the King was crucified, then three days later, made alive. Now that's our hope. That's our assurance. That's where our faith lies, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is all about. Everything else is secondary. It's the gospel. That's the gospel. And let me tell you this, the resurrection can change you. The resurrection can change you. It's changed me. You know what the resurrection can do with deadbeat dads? It can make them into loving fathers. You know what the resurrection can do to those who've had a life of crime? It can make them into incredible citizens and examples to others. The resurrection changes lives. It changes the lives of prostitutes. It changes the lives of drug dealers. It changes the lives of all of those who encounter the resurrected Jesus Christ. And the resurrection can change you. I hope and pray that you'll allow God, that you'll encounter Jesus as Saul encountered Jesus. I pray that you encounter him in a way in which you just surrender your life to him, that you re- receive his good measure. And you hold on to it. And for all of your life, you allow God to transform you and to change you and to be made into the image of Jesus. And you can say, by God's grace, I am what I am. By God's grace, I am what I am. He's changed me. He's completely changed me. And changed you as well. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for your incredible and matchless grace that you've had in our life. God, I thank you for the gospel message. Father, I thank you that you allowed me to receive it. Father, I pray if there's any here today who need to make that decision, to trust you maybe for the first time to receive, that you would give them the, the courage and the confidence. Father, but thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you for your incredible love that you poured out and you displayed on the cross. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So be standing. If you got-